All right, well, why don't we get started? Um, well, welcome everybody. I'm Glenn Ruga, the founder and director of the Social Documentary Network. This event is being recorded and it will be posted on the SDN YouTube channel in a few days. And the chat is open and we'd love to hear from you, hear where you're from. And uh, so just uh, tell us, say hi and tell us where you're from in the chat. It'd be great to see where everybody's Zooming from. Really excited to be hosting this panel tonight on View from COP and what it means for visual storytellers, which is most of us. This is clearly the, the defining issue of our times and trumps all others. The, the pandemic will pale in comparison to the effects of climate change that if left to continue on its course will leave us in the world that can no longer support life as we know it. So this clearly is a challenge for um, everyone, but in our realm for visual storytellers in uh, the upcoming future. Um, while many of you have attended um, prior so Documentary Matters events hosted by Social Documentary Network in the past, there are a lot of new faces out here that have come in from different areas. And I just wanna say wel welcome everybody to the uh, Documentary Matters program. I wanna recognize our sponsor, Digital Silver Imaging, a digital photo lab in Belmont, Massachusetts that offers outstanding printing, finishing, and exhibition services for leading photo artists throughout the US and beyond. And if um, Eric Luden or Andrea Zaki are here, if you just wanna say hi, I'm not sure if they're in the audience right now, um, but they've been um, our co-sponsor for Documentary Matters since uh, we started in person in their office five years ago, but uh, since COVID, we've gone online and will continue to be online. And I also wanna recognize the Foundation for Systemic Change, our partner for the Zeke Award for Systemic Change, that this year is focusing on sustainable solutions to the climate crisis. We recently announced a call for entries on this theme and two winners will be awarded a $2,500 cash prize and selected winners will also be featured in the spring issue of Zeke Mag Magazine and in a traveling exhibit of this work. And if your photographic work addresses climate change and particularly solutions to the climate change problem, we hope you'll consider submitting to this call for entries. Uh, the deadlines, um, we've just extended that to January 21st and all information is available on the SDN website. Our moderator for this evening is Michael Snyder. Michael is also the guest editor for the upcoming spring issue of Zeke Magazine, focusing on climate change. He's a photojournalist and filmmaker who uses his combined knowledge of visual storytelling and conservation to create narratives that drive social change. He's a climate journalism fellow at the Bertha Foundation, a Portrait of Humanity Award winner, a Decade of Change Award winner, a Blue Earth Alliance photographer, a Society of Environmental Journalists member, and a National Geographic contributor. Mike will also be teaching two classes with SDN starting in February, and information about his and other classes will be available next week. Before I turn this over to Michael, we'll have a Q&A at the end of this program, and if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, please use the raise your hand function, um, the button which is access from the reactions button at the very bottom of your Zoom window. And we'll take questions in the order that they were asked. Um, we're not gonna take, we're not gonna monitor the chat for questions unless we run out of raised hands. So we prefer that you use the raise your hand to ask questions. So allow me to now turn this over to Michael Snyder who will moderate this discussion. Michael. Thanks for that, Glenn. Well, hi, folks. Uh, welcome, and thanks for having me tonight. My name is Mike Snyder. Um, like Glenn said, I'm a photographer. I'm a filmmaker. I'm based in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, and it's really great to see quite a few faces here that I recognize, uh, as well as many that I don't, and that's equally as, as exciting. Uh, so I'm, I'm super excited for tonight's conversation. We have some really talented visual stories set tellers here, um, some from the US as, as well as abroad. Uh, and they're gonna be sharing both their work and their thoughts with us. And I'm gonna introduce you to them in, in just a minute. Uh, but before doing so, I just wanted to give you a, a brief story of um, how I got here and why I think this conversation is so important. Uh, so I grew up on 12 acres of woodland in rural Appalachia, and it was a place that was 
at one time incredibly beautiful, um, but also being actively disfigured by industrial extraction, quite, quite literally or around me uh, as I was growing up. I could see timber um, felled on one side and, and coal on the other. Uh, and, and because of that experience as a, as a child, um, I ended up studying environmental um, science at the graduate level. Um, so that's what my training is in. Um, and when I, when I left that program, I came away with two deeply held beliefs that have lingered with me. And, and the first is that the ecological crisis and the climate crisis are the core fights of our generation, much like Glenn said. And if for no other reason that they stand to impact literally every other issue that we, we care about or that we face. And the second thing that I was really hit with and just flabbergasted by is, despite what we already know scientifically about these issues, just how little um, we seem to be doing, particularly at the time. I think, thankfully, we've made some progress since then. And, and this lack of action has a name. Um, it's called the, the knowledge action gap or the value action gap. And tonight isn't the space to un unpack the complexities of that, um, but it's one of the core realizations that I had. Uh, and, and part of the realization I have is that story and storytelling are one of the key things that move us um, individually and collectively from knowledge to action. Um, so it can't just be information about environmental issues. That's important. Science is super important, but it also has to be coupled with powerful stories that show a few things. And, and they are to, to list what the issues are, why they exist, what we stand to lose, um, what we love enough to protect, what solutions we have at our disposal and what visions we have for a better world. And it's those last two things that I'm starting to see more and more in media, and I'm really excited about, the solutions focus and the visions focus. So visual storytelling, photography, and film, they, they play a huge role in that conversation. And I became a photographer and filmmaker and for the last 10 years. I've been trying to push a lot of people together in the room, the artists, activists, scientists, journalists, uh, policymakers, and say, hey, we've, we've got to talk to each other, and we've got to learn how to become better storytellers. And as storytellers, we've got to learn how to become um, better at driving impact around our work. Uh, and that in a nutshell is why I was at the climate conference was, was doing that work. Um, so with, with that seed planted, I want to introduce you to each of our panelists uh, for tonight. Uh, I'm gonna introduce them one at a time and then we'll come back around to each of them and give them about 15 minutes uh, to present their work uh, and their thoughts about, about their work broadly, also about being involved um, with the climate conference this year. If you have a, a question that comes up, and I, I really hope you do uh, during the conversations, um, you can feel free to put it in the chat and we'll cycle back around to that at the end. Or when we come um, to the end of the, of the program, um, you can also just uh, either raise your hand or um, unmute yourself and, and you can ask. Okay, so first on our panel tonight, we have Virginia Hanusik, who's an artist uh, whose projects explore the relationship between landscape, culture, and the built environment. Uh, her work has been exhibited internationally, uh, featured in The New Yorker, National Geographic, British Journal of Photography, and many other outlets. Her current body of work is examining flooding and the politics of disaster on the Mississippi River watershed. Uh, she's a 2020-2021 uh, photography fellow with Exhibit Columbus, and she lives in New Orleans. Speaking next after Virginia will be Fede Zuivra. Fede is a storyteller, filmmaker, and land defender based in Mexico and Guatemala. He works with social movements and communities to develop narratives that respond to day-to-day -day struggles that dismantle oppressive structures. Uh, Fede was recently an observer delegate and speaker at the UN Climate Conference where he shared stories from the front lines of climate change and championed in, um, indigenous land management solutions. And Fede and I were recent fellows together at the Bertha Foundation. Uh, and finally, we've got Greg, Greg Kahn with us tonight. And Greg is an American documentary, fine art, uh, documentary and fine art photographer. He's based in DC and New York City, and his work concentrates on issues that shape personal and cultural identity. His Pulitzer Prize nominated project, It's Not a House, It's a Home, explores how the foreclosure crisis in Florida defined a new class of homelessness. And his ongoing project, Three Millimeters, which is how I know him, uh, explores uh, the, how the quiet depletion of land due to sea level rise is a catalyst for the evolution of the inhabitants' identity. So uh, to kick us off, I'm going to hand the mic over to Virginia, and she's going to start by sharing some of her thoughts and work. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. And um, just let me know if you can't hear me that well. I'm sorry if my computer is a bit um, low with the volume here. Um, here we go. Um, so thank you so much for everyone for joining us this evening. Um, I like to start out with this quote um, by Toni Morrison, which really sets the tone um, and intention for this presentation and how we think about the movement of water, which is prim a primarily, um, which is a primary focus of, of my practice. Um, 
I'm based in, in New Orleans. That's where I'm, I'm joining you from this evening. And I, I wanna just use this time to go through a bit around my, my um, approach to, to my work, um, a couple of the projects that I've been working on in, in the past few years, um, but also be before that, just talking a little bit about the current um, ecological environmental situation here in Louisiana, which I'm surrounded by people who are, are very much involved in this world already in this audience. Um, so I'm sure that that's not going to be news to, to many people, but we will just give you a quick overview here. Um, so you'll see this map is of the Mississippi River watershed and the dot is where I'm joining you from this evening. Uh, the watershed itself is 40% of the continental US and I just love to start, you know, talking about what it means to make work in, in the specific location because of just how connected it is to the rest of the country through, through these waterways. Um, I started really focusing my projects on climate change when I moved to Louisiana um, in 2014. I'm from New York originally. Um, there was a disconnect between what I was seeing in on the news and what I was experiencing as a resident. Louisiana is the most flood prone state in the country um, in terms of coastal, fluvial, and, and, and when it comes to rain causing surface flooding. Um, just these maps are, are well circulated at this point, but think talking about the coastal land loss crisis that the state is facing here. Um, this is projected land loss um, into 2050, if nothing is done. I'll get into kind of some of the strategies that are currently underway right here, or excuse me, right now that I focus a lot of my work on in, in documenting. Um, so, the big question for me and, and how I approach my work and thinking about um, you know, the conversation that, that we'll be having tonight is how do we visualize these massive changes on a scale of this level? And historically, if you've Googled images of climate change, um, these have traditionally been the images that you find. I think that we've gotten a lot better in the past several years for diversifying this visual iconography. Um, but it is certainly an iconography that's been developed um, to a point where it's almost stock images when talking about, about stories around climate change. Um, and, I, and I question a lot in my practice what these images have done and their motivating power in, in um, you know, leading people to action and challenging whether these images have caused a level of dissociation um, if they've done the opposite of motivating people and worst case scenario, people becoming less engaged. So these are kind of questions that I explore um, in, in my own practice. So, and also the concept of, of there isn't one image to sum up climate change as, as a whole. You know, it's very multifaceted, it impacts all aspects of life. Um, getting away from just using images of flooding or disaster imagery to con to convey these these issues. Um, so in the case of Louisiana, I was used to consuming uh, the visual rhetoric of the landscape here through aerial imagery, through disaster imagery, post hurricane imagery. Um, but as I began working with communities, again, this is a map of uh, projected land loss along the coast here. Um, working with communities and hearing more about their lived experience along the coast. Um, it wasn't necessarily, I don't want to use the word dramatic, but the changes were more subtle and on a daily lived experience level versus just talking about these issues from when a hurricane hits or when a massive flood happens. Um, so working on projects that were related to the state's coastal master plan, um, which is a massive endeavor to mitigate the rate of land loss along the coast and literally change the course of the Mississippi River. It's a $50 billion project that's intended to be executed in phases. Um, and you can see some of those components here. And also involved in the urban water management planning um, that was happening in New Orleans, which was meant to really integrate more blue space into the city and help with the city's subsidence problem, which Every drop of rain gets pumped out of the city of New Orleans currently, um, which has led the, the ground to be extremely um, 
you know, dry. And, and if you've ever been here, we have a very massive pothole problem to the point where we have an Instagram account dedicated to just how crumbling our infrastructure is. Um, so it would be funny if it's not so, if it wasn't so terrible. This is a popular image that I didn't take this picture, but it was circulating during the August 2017 floods um, when there was a failure in, in, with the pumps in the city and uh, a neighborhood that I live in. Here, I live like two blocks away. This is what, what the streets looked like. Anyway, um, so what, <laughs> what are some different ways of communicating these, these um, very important and, and massive changes in, in the landscape? Um, and how can we show these complex problems in a way rather than the aerial or disaster imagery that's been a dominant force? Um, so this work in New Orleans uh, led to a project that would become a receding coast, the architecture and infrastructure of South Louisiana that I worked on um, from around 2015 to 2018, funded um, thankfully by the Graham Foundation. Um, and focusing a lot on, you know, the structural differences throughout the coast um, as a means of understanding the future of the built environment in this region. So you'll see if you're driving in air, any area throughout coastal Louisiana, you'll have slab on grade houses next to houses that are raised 20 feet that are, you know, very close to houseboats. So using architecture as a, as a way of exploring, um, you know, the different, the policy that's currently in place that is not comprehensive, that allows for different um, forms of protections across, across populations. Um, and then I don't, for the sake of time, I'll just go through this very quickly. I'm from the Hudson Valley. I talk a lot about landscape value through art and painting and photography and how that landscape, um, how certain landscapes are seen as more valuable over others and the, per the perpetuation of that notion through art. Um, so very proud to be from there, as I said, but in terms of the history of, of this region, um, these are important examples of how land can be used to say something about who we are just as much as portraiture. Um, these iconic paintings were considered at the time to be divine truth, but in reality were used, as I said, to perpetuate, you know, the colonial idea of land ownership um, and control of the land. So I think a lot about as um, landscape art as a tool to create value, what landscapes are more desirable than others, um, and how that relates to where I'm currently working in in Louisiana and how that has been a place that has not been represented on the same scale as New York's Hudson River Valley or the American West or, um, you know, the canon of American landscape art, um, it's, it's not necessarily in there. So in an exploration into new ways of visualizing water and hard infrastructure in the greater New Orleans area, um, this is a body of work from, I want to say 2019 to the end of last year, so about two years. Um, looking more at like some ethereal images of, cre of, of portraying infrastructure um, over Lake Pontchartrain and, and the areas around that are connected to the water that are not necessarily seen on an everyday basis because they're blocked off by levees or um, by flood walls. And I know I'm breezing through this, I'm sorry, but um, in thinking about how the systems that we visualize um, climate change with and, and thinking about this hard infrastructure, which is a major component of my work. Um, for the past year and a half, I've been a photography fellow with the exhibit Columbus Foundation um, to talk, to develop a, a project that connects the Mississippi watershed to New Orleans. Obviously thinking about water, um, how it shapes so much of Louisiana. And I was interested in diving into this history of the river and how the human engineering of landscapes thousands of miles away impact what we're currently experiencing here in Louisiana. Um, I was looking into major floods that have occurred over the past century or so. And this is by no means a full list um, to better understand how our current infrastructure system came to be and the policies that protect certain communities over others. Um, and I became curious 
about different ways to approach photographing these systems that have failed or could be argued that are working the way that they intended to be by design. And um, just to give some context here, uh, of the extent we've altered the course of the river, these are um, maps that were made in the 1940s, which demonstrate the various ways the river's course has changed over time um, versus the very elaborate system of levees that the Army Corps of Engineers has executed um, starting in the early 20th century. Um, so focusing on three categories that connect these places from the Midwest to New Orleans, infrastructure, obviously, uh, particularly the history of creating this hard infrastructure and the labor practices that have been tied to it. Who does this infrastructure serve and how sustainable is it? Um, agriculture, so heavy rain, melting snow that washes massive amounts of nutrients from lawns and other sources across the Mississippi River into the Gulf. Um, and once there, these nutrients trigger algae blooms that literally choke off oxygen in the water, making it impossible for marine life to survive. In 2017, the um, dead zone was the size of the state of New Jersey. So, uh, and also logistics. So I'm looking at the role of shipping and how the need to maintain a constant river course uh, has influenced environmental degradation. Um, so I say, I say this approaching this work in, you know, the context of, of the, the, theme of what we're talking about tonight as a approach to looking at these issues of climate change of the climate crisis through built structural systems and enable these processes to be um, that were designed that are human engineered and how we're currently stuck in these systems that are absolutely unsustainable for a number of reasons um, and kind of looking at the history of inequality built in into these systems. Um, so again, just guiding questions that I used for this project. Uh, what does it physically look like? Uh, what is its future? And as I mentioned, the sites here that I was working in over the past two years um, were picked because of their historical significance and, and how they depict infrastructure in a um, social and physical context, excuse me, social and cultural context. Um, and I'll just go through here a little bit quickly, but starting in the Midwest, um, looking at some of the reasons for such intense water control systems, it's impossible to not talk about agriculture and the ways we've altered landscapes to grow crops and livestock. It was important for me to connect these scenes in the greater watershed with what's happening in Louisiana. Um, they're inherently connected. And in terms of sites that demonstrate another aspect of the agricultural component um, is the new Madrid floodway, which runs through Missouri and its connection to Cairo, Illinois, um, which is a majority black city of about 3000 people. And during the 2011 floods, the city came dangerously close to flooding. Um, it's at the confluence of the Ohio and the Mississippi rivers. Uh, because of late decisions made by the Army Corps to open the new Madrid floodway and big landowners opposed to opening the floodway to protect their farmland. So thinking about how this um, infrastructure is absolutely not neutral, that there are a lot of decisions um, made as to how it should operate and what communities it is going to protect. In Memphis, looking at the cultural memory along the river, how it's used for recreation, the history of industry. And Greenville, obviously, is the site of the 1927 flood, one of the massive breaches in the Mississippi River. Um, so as I was traveling up and down the river for the past two years, um, thinking about how the rate of which flooding is, is happening at a um, 
increased, you know, it's happening more frequently because of climate change. What does it mean for these, these areas that have such a very set structure that is based off of predictions and, um, you know, 100 or 500 year storm predictions and how that is not necessarily the case anymore in terms of what is actually going to be protecting people. Um, and I'm just going for the sake of time a little faster, but um, these images were on display recently at Exhibit Columbus, which was a, a biennial of architecture and art in Columbus, Indiana. So it was up from August until November. Um, some more flood walls. So just tying it into again, what I'm looking at doing currently in my practice, specifically in South Louisiana, is being able to talk about the role of the fossil fuel industry um, and being held accountable for the environmental loss that has happened here. Um, I was evacuated for 11 days during Hurricane Ida. And at that time, um, you know, thinking about just how much land has been lost that has allowed the impacts of storms to become that much worse in our coastal communities here. So um, I think, you know, again, just bringing it back to the theme of this panel, focusing on remembering space and understanding that there are places that are not going to be able to um, exist in the decades to come at this point and holding accountable industries and, and um, you know, entities that have been responsible for, for that happening, but also um, thinking and being able to talk a lot about the history of the inequality that's been embedded in, in this infrastructure. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny, that was yeah. great. Uh, well, I, I absolutely love your work. It's um, it's it's just stunning. The fine art approach that you have is is very evident, and the the lens that you have of looking at this issue through infrastructure, uh, I think is a, is a fascinating and, and much needed one. So, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, I want to introduce next uh, Fede, if you want to share. Hey everybody, um, thank you very much, Virginia, for this presentation. I think that I will link in, in my presentation this question around inequality and the structural reasons and the structural inequality behind uh, the climate crisis. Um, so I'm going to briefly introduce what I do because it, it has to do with visual storytelling. Uh, I, I studied filmmaking, uh, but at some point I decided that I couldn't do the work that I needed to do in the film industry because of how it is shaped and how it works. I didn't find the possibility to create these um, this social, social changes that I was willing um, and I, I still uh, trying, to, trying to work. Um, so I am from Mexico. I am right now in Brazil in an incredible space uh, that is called uh, media media ninja i hope that uh, you can look at it uh, and what i'm going to present uh, because of time's sake is just a brief of a lot of work that has to do with a lot of people uh, i am involved in different projects but uh, i will showcase a little bit of what is done uh, in the intersection of visual storytelling narratives and investigation around structural inequality. So um, I'm going to share my screen very quickly. And also if somebody is interested in anything that I will show, um, it is, everything is creative commons, everything is up in the internet and I can share the links. Uh, so if anybody wants to go in depth into any of this work, uh, please uh, feel free to, to ask for this. So I'm going to put a little timer. Um, so the first thing in this, the reason why I am here, I'm guessing, uh, because I shared with uh, Mike uh, this process of the Verta Fellowship where 
uh, the question was how are we going to link um, the, the, what the government and the corporations are doing with indigenous territories to the climate crisis. And I did this work with another Berta fellow uh, that is, uh, that her name is Andres Chu in Guatemala. And I am not going to showcase right now, uh, but uh, after a year of investigation and recording and interviewing and documenting, three uh, documentaries came out of this investigation, which I hope that you can come and look at them. They are three uh, documentaries around um, three different stories of indigenous land defenders, indigenous women land defenders in Guatemala. And the work that we developed somehow is how we can create storytelling that can showcase the alternatives, the living alternatives to the climate crisis, while at the same time, we can point at those who are responsible for a lot of what is happening now. So I won't go in, in depth into these uh, three stories, but you can look at them uh, after this uh, year of investigation, these three documentaries, uh, a series came out. You can look at them. They have um, uh, uh, subtitles in English. There are also some podcasts that resume a little bit of the investigation, the journalistic investigation, and at the same time, um, uh, sorry, I think that, uh, sorry, no, that, that wasn't for me. Okay, so the second thing that I wanted to showcase has to do with the narrative investigation and the narrative work that we do at Culture Hack Labs, which is one of the projects where I collaborate with. Uh, and basically what we do is, is a team of people who are investigating and are looking at narratives from a, a, a social media perspective and from a narrative perspective. So we analyze a lot of the media and of the public discourse around issues. In this case, we analyzed the discourse around uh, climate emergency just before the COP, uh, because we are also talking about the COP. I'm going to close very quickly with something, but I wanted to share a couple of the of the findings of the key findings of this framing, because we think that there is a lot about the framing that we need to work as storytellers to starting to reshape the narrative that is present around climate emergency. So as we know from uh, the last um, the last IPCC uh, report, we are heading to uh, more than two degrees in climate emergency worldwide. Uh, but we analyzed what came out in the media after this IPCC report, and these are key 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 points that the media focused right that the best case scenario is already a bad scenario. Uh, we are going to cross the 1.5 degrees Celsius if things doesn't change at all, that that's what we saw after the COP26, that we need to adapt to the current crisis, that this is not something that will happen in the future, but it's already happening, and we need to take immediate action, that the current changes will last for hundreds or thousands of years, and that we are leaving the delayed consequences of, of burning of, of more than one century of burning fossil fuels. And there is something that came out also in this report, which is very important, and is the scientifically proven human influence in climate change. But at the same time, as um, storytellers from the global south, we want to challenge one little assumption. And we, we ask, where is the intersectionality where, where the IPCC calls for human influence, right? Um, and there are recent investigations that show the responsibility of climate emergency that is 92% in the global north or rich countries, which are responsible for more than 20, uh, the 92% of the, the global carbon dioxide surplus uh, per person, right? So this is very important in terms of, of what we are talking about responsibility. 
And at the same time, Oxfam uh, shared this investigation that tells that 1% of the rich double the emissions of the poorest 50% of the population in the earth, right? So we talk, when we talk about climate change, we are talking about um, structural inequality. And we need five planet Earths if as planet, as a planet, we want, uh, we want to uh, a consumption pattern as the average North American. And this is, I think, important for the storytellers in this panel. But in contrast, for example, indigenous peoples have the smallest ecological footprint in the planet, which means that their existence is within the planetary boundaries, right? So what we need to start reshaping about how we tell the story of climate change is that, is that those few humans that influence climate change are also responsible for the ecocide and the genocide. And where does this come from? Um, what we know uh, from also recent uh, investigations is that the colonial, the colonialism in this continent in America or how it was called before Abi Ayala, killed more than 56 million people in less than two centuries. This is one of the biggest genocides uh, in history. But at the same time, this, this genocide wasn't only in this continent, but also all the lives that needed, uh, that, that this colonization infrastructure needed from African uh, people. So we need to start rethinking also on when started this crisis, right? And we also, uh, we can also see that 94% uh, of the animal population was exterminated in this continent, in the Southern part of the continent in the last 50 years, which means that there is a direct relationship between neo neoliberal capitalism with the climate emergency that we are living today. And the same thing, the growth, the economical growth has exceeded already plus two the planetary boundaries, which means that the raw material consumption has grown exponentially in the last 20 years, in the last 50 years, but specifically in the last 20 years. And that it has proven that the imperative of growth has proven false. The economy cannot grow infinitely on a finite planet. So that means how can we start shifting the narrative that is, that is told about climate emergency? Then we can start by the crisis as the cumulative result of the greed of a few who have plundered the earth for more than 500 years. Colonialism, capitalism, racism, patriarchy, and anthropocentrism are the root systems of inequality behind the current crisis. That the excess of carbon emissions and consumption in the last century is related to the globalization of capitalism and the imperative of growth. That human influence in climate change is related to the ecocide and the genocide that maintain the privileges of a few. And those ecocide and genocide that started 500 years ago are still ongoing today, which is something very important to say too. Uh, but what about the living alternatives? What are the existing alternatives that already live in this planet? So I'm not going to go very into deep depth into this because it takes a little bit of more time. But what I want to say is that a lot of the research that we've been doing with indigenous communities has to do to showcase how the living solutions are already in the 80% of the remaining biodiversity in the world, which is actually in indigenous territories. Even if after colonization, the, uh, this, this population uh, has, is only now the 6% of the world's population, it protects more than 80% of the remaining biodiversity, which is very important. And when we talk about indigenous, we are actually talking about the most diverse and biodiverse regions in the world. So indigenous is only the colonial name that we have put to the biggest biodiversity in the world. 
And as I said, the footprint of these people, which is basically the same, um, uh, is, is the same population as, uh, as the United States, for example, are already living lives that are within planetary boundaries, right? But there is a very important thing here uh, because these indigenous peoples who are already living within planetary boundaries and are defending 80% of the remaining biodiversity are also the most impacted by climate change, but also by the mitigation measures that are being taken by the global community. And this is something that is very important to tell about what happened during the COP. I am not going to go into depth into this part. And I know that this is, this is to showcase also uh, visual storytelling. But what I wanted to say is that tomorrow, actually, we're going to release a, a, a small document where we have put a lot of these narratives that we have heard during the COP and after the COP. And I'm going to return very quickly to these stories of indigenous land defenders. Um, just to close, and I'm not going to put uh, sound to this, but I want this to, to be on the back while I, I finish this, um, this presentation. And it has to do on how us as storytellers can start to point to these root causes of inequality and these root causes of climate change, while at the same time, we don't, you know, like tell these stories of the doomed world, right? Because we are also in, in a very complicated moment in time where we need at least 25% of the world's population to start shifting their ways of thinking, to start shifting their ways of uh, existing in this world, of consuming in this world, of living in this world. So what we want to do as storytellers is not only to point at the root causes, but at the same time to start pointing at those possible solutions that already exist. We don't really need to invent big technologies. We only need to start listening to those who are already living and uh, coexisting with the earth. So uh, what I want to, to, to share at the, at the end of this presentation is that after this year of investigation with indigenous land defenders, what we found was that there was a big need also to, to start rethinking our own storytelling, to allow these epistemologies of indigenous land defenders, of indigenous communities to emerge in our own um, storytelling. So I'm going to finish with just one of these um, findings, let's say. I can share all of these with, with you at the end of the presentation, um, but I wanted to share a couple of, um, sorry, yes. And I want, to, I want to share a couple of the, um, of the key findings of how to tell these stories visually, but also um, with film, right? So it is important to tell the emergency as a consequence, to tell the story of the crisis as a symptom, not as a disease. The intersectional storytelling is such an important thing to tell the climate crisis and the structural inequalities, to name the responsibility proportional to the privileges. And then when we talk about the machine of extermination or what is currently destroying life in earth, it is really important to name the ecocide, the past and the present, to name the genocide, the past and the present, to name the climate justice as the need of immediately stopping this extermination, because this is not something that is that's ha that has happened 500 years ago, but it is something that is happening now. And abolish structural inequalities is also an important need for climate justice. And just uh, to finish this presentation, uh, how to tell the, the, the stories of these living alternatives to climate crisis, 
it is important to name the diversity of indigenous land defenders and also of other non-indigenous who are already uh, creating these spaces of imagination and are defending the, the, the land. So tell the crisis from those perspectives is such an important thing. To amplify indigenous voices and their epistemologies, not being an intermediary is such an important thing and visibilize actions in defense of life and territories as living alternatives to the climate crisis. And with, what, with that, I want to end the presentation. And I'm sorry that I couldn't show a lot more of images, but I'm sure that if you want to, 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 to hear more about this, I can share a lot, of these, a lot of these presentations and a lot of these stories that are actually existing. So I invite you actually to, to take a look a deeper look at these presentations because you can already look at some of these uh, narrative storytelling that is already telling the stories from the alternative. So thank you very much to everybody. And I hope that this has been useful. Thank you so much, Fede. Thank you. And if you can, Fede, if you can put some of those links into the chat, because I'm sure there are plenty of people that would love to follow up um, with some of that content. Uh, and, I, and I just want to follow back and, and quickly say that your work is certainly a huge inspiration for me. And a lot of times in the classes that, that I teach, we talk about how you know, this work certainly begins with creating great images. You know, that's critical. You know, we've gotta, we have to have compelling, visually compelling work, whether it's filmmaking or photography, but that's, that's not enough. The, the bigger question here is what kinds of stories are we telling and whose stories are these? And do these stories point us towards meaningful change, right? And so this question of story, question of storytelling um, is an essential one. And so thank you so much for providing some of that um, background context. There's, there's so much more there to, to unpack and we'll definitely be excited to, to, to dig more into your work. So thank you so much for that. And I, and I wanted to say finally that um, this question of indigenous land management, it was really exciting at the climate conference to hear that I've been at um, other climate conferences in the past and sort of the tiny echoes of that question, but this time around that conversation um, seems to be something that is very much um, in, in, in movement. And I think the next couple of years, we will see whether or not we can sustain that energy uh, and look at that as a, a, a very real solution for, for parts of this planet. So stay tuned around that topic of indigenous land management. Thanks. Fede, and then I want to hand it over to Greg Khan, who will speak and present last, and then we will follow up with questions afterwards. Thanks, Greg. Thank you so much, Michael. And um, I just want to say I, I truly admire the work that Fede and, and Virginia are doing. Um, it is such profound storytelling that is so necessary um, during these times. And, and so thank you both for your presentation. I, I, learn so much from both of them and, and I really appreciate what you guys are doing. Um, for my presentation, um, I have been working on the eastern shore of Maryland since 2012. Um, I moved to Washington DC from Florida after a, a five-year stint at a, a newspaper in southwest Florida and when I got here one of the first things I stumbled across was a PDF put together by the Department of Natural Resources in Maryland that uh, the line that stood out to me was the, the sea level rise was happening at twice the global average. And that was something that I, I hadn't really seen before um, and hadn't noticed um, anyone referencing up to that point. So I decided to head out to the Eastern shore um, and start looking into what was happening there. Um, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. So when I talk about the Eastern shore, uh, maybe, maybe some people are not familiar with it, but it's looking at this, uh, the Chesapeake Bay here, this, this water that comes straight up through the center of the screen. And you're looking at just the coastline that's along the right side of that. Um, and according to Climate Central and a lot of the projections by scientists, this is what it will look like um, once sea level rise kind of impacts that area. And the idea is, is that we're not, this isn't some far off thing. You know, Virginia mentioned it uh, in, in her talk, you know, 
we're used to these disaster images. We're used to the blockbuster films of, you know, the water rising up to this torch of the Statue of Liberty. And it's just so much more nuanced than that. Um, there's so much more uh, detail in these stories. And, you know, zooming in on a place like Chrisfield, I mean, this is literally a town built on oyster shells. Um, and it was considered the seafood capital of the world. And as you can see here with the projections, it will be completely underwater. And this is the kind of thing where you're not just losing land, but you're losing community. And that's something that I really wanted to dive into with this project because, and you'll see, you know, here's, an ex here's Chrisfield. Um, and I just wanted to really get a sense of like what that looks like when you're seeing a, a, a city or a town that may not be around. And really what it comes down to is this idea that, that three millimeters is, is a nuanced thing. It's, we're talking about something that's not this great storm that comes through and washes away things, but it's, it's this. It's a slow moving tide. It's almost you know, something that, that people usually wouldn't care so much about, but it comes over a road like this. Now, this is a main access road for an area um, through the Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge. And when this happens, it's, it's salt water. And so vehicles traveling over it can uh, deteriorate and wear down and it can cause um, the vehicle to break down over time. It can choke off communities. And when this is happening more often, um, you have things like schools letting out early when they know there's gonna be a high tide. You have different communities having to uh, react in different ways based on this small amount of water. And so to start, I wanted to really kind of go and look at the, the problem in a, in a larger view. I wanted to look at things like, you know, what happens when the tide comes up? You know, it, it used to be that it would need a storm, but now you have nuisance flooding that happens on a, on a nice day or just wind that comes out from the south that pushes water up into the bay and then you have a high tide and it'll bring it right over. I mean, we just experienced something like that recently. And some of the flooding, I was out on Tangier a couple uh, weekends ago, and they had the most flooding they'd had since uh, Hurricane Isabel. And that's saying something because it, it wasn't a great storm. It was, it was a very windy day and the conditions were just right. So once again, it was kind of traveling around, looking at these places, looking at the different ways that water can intrude and this to me is one of my, the, the bigger examples. Um, what you have here at the top of the screen is you have the, the dense forest that used to exist. And what happens is as salt water intrudes, it creates these ghost forests as they're called where these trees have died and, and you, know, you can see the trees right in the middle there, these uh, loblolly pines that have lost a lot of their foliage and are now becoming kind of like these, they, they call them like, you know, sticking up like finger bones in the marsh. And then even lower in the frame, you see it becomes just marsh. And then even lower in the frame, you see open water. And this is how it creeps year after year, very slowly until this whole area will be open water. Things that I wanted to focus on as well include the migratory patterns of birds. The ripple effect, no pun intended, but the, the ripple effect of this sea level rise really reaches into all facets of life. So when I'm looking at this, we're identifying these problems and we're identifying these issues with trees and landscape and things like that. And, and we see that, but what that really connects to for me is the community. And when you have a community that has you know been built around the water and identifies with the water and I you know everyone's a waterman and everyone connects to their family as watermen and you start to see that disappear and for example this is Holland Island where um, this is a grave site that has been left on Holland Island where the last house fell into the bay in 2010 now you have um, this grave site with no plans to save any of the the grave sites here and eventually they will be washed out into the bay. So really for me, what it was is to look at this problem, but 
dive into the community aspect because for me, what what makes the most sense is to connect it to people and make you care about the people that live there because it's hard to care about a problem as we see with just imagery that just shows disaster. And I think what happens is we, we look at disaster images and we become numb to them. But I think if you build a story around people and you learn to care about these people and care about their lives and care about the things that they are doing, then I think that ends up becoming a more powerful story and become, leads to more action. And so looking at this, we're looking at a lot of the different structures and a lot of different ways that, that things are deteriorating. And we look at the watermen that live out in this area. And one of the watermen that I met was a 92 year old named Art Daniels. And he'd been working the water since he was a teenager. And you know, at this time he was still working on the water. Um, he was starting to lose his memory. And I had him recite uh, a poem for me that he had written about working on the water. Uh, and if you go to the website that I just launched, the three millimeters.com, um, it will, it, you know, there's a video with him reading that poem. And so I spent time with art. I, I wanted to, to document some of these things because it's, you know, these are kind of the, the last breaths of this community as they're forced to adapt to the smallest, but, you know, most devastating of, of tidal events. Another thing that I'm working on right now as a part of this story is I'm looking at farmland and the Eastern shore is not well known for it, but they do have a lot of farmland out there and that farmland is inundated with salt water. And I'm working with a scientist right now who is looking at what can you do with, with soil that has been inundated with salt water and you can't grow crops on it anymore. Like what, what will grow there? What else can be used so that farmers who are generational farmers can continue to use the land and profit? I spent time going uh, on different, uh, to different homes, looking at some of the damage that's been caused by tidal events, recent storms. Uh, La Coya Alford here was, was actually watching one of the inspectors out on her roof, uh, looking at damage from uh, Superstorm Sandy. Uh, because it, it threw her house off the foundation. And so now she was in a place that kind of tilted to the side and she was trying to, to uh, get FEMA disaster money to help rebuild. But one of the problems is in this area, there's always the, the question of do you rebuild or do you have them relocate? And then a lot of people there don't want to relocate because this is not just their home. I mean, they, they have, like you can see graveyards out front in their front yards, this is a place where they've, they've buried family members. So this isn't a place that they're easily uh, relocating from. But the area itself is really connected to the water. This was uh, from a beauty pageant out in Crisfield. Uh, and this is Miss Crustacean. And this is just another connection to the community that I wanted to show that, that it, it reaches into every facet and it becomes a part of their identity. And when something like this is a part of your identity and it's starting to slowly erode and vanish, what happens? And this is out on Smith Island, one of the last inhabited islands in, in the Maryland Chesapeake Bay. Um, you know, another waterman community. It's, it's interesting because a lot of what we talk about is, you know, these areas where people will be very conservative here. And a lot of times I found that when I went out there initially talking about sea level rise and climate change, I, I was met with a lot of resistance. Um, and I realized I wasn't getting the access that I was looking for. And I think it's because of the way that I approached the story at first. And what I ended up doing was finding that idea of community was a stronger reference because everyone was looking to save the community, scientists and residents alike. And what was really fascinating was you'd have people that would, you know, talk to me and say, oh, it's not, it's not, it's not sea level rise, it's erosion. We have an erosion problem out here. And then they would go on to describe in detail the exact effects of sea level rise scientifically, but they don't connect the two things. And it's become a kind of political jargon to say, you know, 
reference climate change or reference sea level rise. And what I want to be able to do is bridge that gap so that no matter the, the, you know, the political ideology that we're kind of all on the same page because you know, if, if I say sea level rise and somebody shuts me down because of that and I don't get to keep telling stories about what an important community this is, then I've lost something that is, I believe is really important to, to be able to document and, and put out there more into the world. And I think when you lose that kind of history, you lose you know, what people have to say, then I think it's a, it's a bigger issue. And I think things and different problems get swept under the rug or more easily uh, not found to have a remedy. And so a lot of the things that I wanted to do was go trace back the history and the culture from crab picking contests in the summertime and you know what that meant for different communities. Uh, I, like I said, this just came out from a recent assignment out on Tangier Island. Uh, this was my first endeavor into the Chesapeake Bay for the Virginia side, you know, and and they see it, they see it happening. This was, you know, a recent storm damaged all these homes. Uh, and when I say storm, I mean, again, it was just a very strong wind and a high tide that met with it. So I looked at a lot of the things in terms of uh, different communities. This one is across from a church that can date back towards the civil war. Um, this was built shortly after and the community of parishioners that are there. And again, you can see behind the church, they told me that this used to be a church that had a dense forest behind it. And, and now you can see the open water that's there creeping behind the church. They've asked the state for help in relocating the church, but it's difficult because there are so many locations along this area that need to be relocated that the money isn't there. And so what do you do with this piece of history and this location that has a couple decades left. Again, on Smith Island, I followed a pastor. He does three different services on three churches for an island of just over 200 people. And he goes to each church by boat because the roads can't get him there anymore. And, you know, he said something really interesting to me was that, you know, you can, you can build your houses up, but you can't build the roads up basically saying like at a, at a certain point there, you know, it won't be feasible anymore to continue this way of life. And I went to the school there. It's a one room schoolhouse. It teaches kindergarten through eighth grade. And there's about nine students and five are related to each other. So it's a really close community. But again, it used to have 20, 30 students. And now it's, you know, more and more people leaving the island because they don't see a future. And this is the boat that takes students to the high school in the area. So the, it's about a 50 minute ferry ride every morning for the students. And again, I'm looking at trying to find multiple ways of telling the story and multiple storylines that feed back into the same thread. And one of these you can see here, I went out with a team from um, the, uh, forest and wildlife that they were doing prescribed burns. And you may ask, how does that connect with sea level rise? Well, they do these prescribed burns because when they burn off the old growth, it allows new growth to reach the sunlight quicker, therefore fortifying the roots and allowing the new marsh to grow in stronger, which fortifies the soil, which sort of helps against sea level rise. So there's a lot of different methods by which um, different departments are working on it. This is, they're building a natural shoreline here. So they're trying to not just build a wall to pr protect an area, but they're actually building a, a sort of incline of rocks, which provides habitat for different um, animals. And it also provides a little bit of a barrier for uh, tidal events. So that's it. Awesome. Thanks so much, Craig. That was really, really great. And I, and I just want to follow on with, with your work and say that, you know, one, one of the reasons why I wanted to have you here tonight, one of the reasons why I've, I've really admired this work is your focus on 
character driven and narrative driven stories. And the research tells us that that may be one of the very best ways to drive impact around environmental issues is to take these huge, often abstract issues and to make them personal. And hopefully with characters that we can somehow understand, we may understand their motivations or we understand their fears or what it is like to lose something. And so by connecting the big abstract issues to the personal, it's a way to get people to connect to the issues on an individual level. So I think you've done a, a great job with this project. And I wanna say as somebody that's also worked in the Chesapeake Bay, that it's really impressive that you've built this access. I mean, this is um, a very rural part of the world that is not very trusting of outsiders. So your ability to you know, win the hearts of people in a, in a very delicate space that's on the front lines of this um, says a lot for you as a photographer. And, and the uh, I appreciate that. Speak Thank you. That. I mean, I think what you said was, was really true though. I mean, you know, I've, I gave a talk at UVA recently to a bunch of scientists and showed this work. And I basically just was getting emails afterwards saying like, hey, would you, would you like to help visualize this project that I've been working on? I've been struggling because I have all this data but I'm not reaching the people that I want to because I don't have the, the visuals that need to connect it. Um, and so I found a lot of partnerships that way. And I think it's been really wonderful because I love the idea of connecting science to human stories and, and seeing how those two things really can, can evolve and, and tell a more impactful story. Awesome. Well, with that in mind, I want to turn it over to questions. And, and just before doing so, I want to point out that in the chat, I put some links to um, our presenters work as well to a body of work that I have and also to climate visuals, um, which I know that Greg was in. I was in this year. Virginia, were you in climate visuals as well? This year? Okay, no, but they're, they're a repository of um, uh, climate stories uh, from around the world that's recently come out that was on show at the climate conference. So if you want to ask any questions, um, we've got about another 20 minutes, feel free to unmute, unmute yourself and do so. And if nobody does, I have a few that are prepared as well. well Mike, I don't see any hands raised. So um, may I ask the first question? Please go ahead, Glenn. Um, so, so the theme of, of this panel is um, COP26 and what it means for visual storytellers. So here we are at this point where the world more than ever is recognizing what, what we're facing. We just had this major international conference with people from all over presenting all different perspectives. Um, everybody's going home now and, um, you know, SDN has thousands of visual storytellers connected with it, as well as, as the rest of the world of photographers that now want to address this. Can, can either Mike or any one of the panelists just say, is anything different moving forward from this point for visual storytellers? Is, is there a particular um, concept or theme or focus that we should be thinking about um, moving into the next year or into the next five years for visual storytellers? about um, how to contribute to a solution to the climate crisis. I can, I can take a quick answer maybe. Um, I, I really like this, um, this last article from George Monbiot, which I'm going to share uh, here. But basically, um, well, and what we have heard after COP26 is a lot of deception uh, from the general public, from the people there. Everybody was expecting a lot more from uh, the global leaders. And I think that there is, there is a very big uh, and important work in terms of the storytelling of the COP and also of the climate emergency, which has to do with who can do the change, right? And right now, the, the, the big media and also the narrative is that the change and the possibilities of big decisions are in that institutional space where presidents and governments can decide, right? Um, but actually, and what George Monbiot Mon Mon said uh, is that that's a possibility, yes, but the other possibility is the structural change and the change that comes from um, a big 
critic mass of people thinking about alternatives and thinking about other ways to react and to live in this world. So what he says actually is that if we manage somehow in the biggest movement in history that we have seen, uh, manage that 25% of the population change, shifts it, its thinking about how we need to address these issues, then we can create the necessary changes. So I think that in terms of, um, of what storytellers need to start thinking also ahead is how we can shift also the stories from these big and institutionalized decision spaces to what the people can actually do and what the people is already doing. So that's what I will say in terms of what, what is coming because not, nothing, nothing shows that there's going to be a big change in COP27 in terms of what the, the governments are decisioning. So I think that we need to start thinking in terms of storytelling, how we are going to move and shift the power from those institutional space to the people. Yeah, thank you for that. I'd like to ask a question. Go ahead, Ken. This is, this is uh, Kent Fairfield. Uh, I'm really impressed with what you folks have captured and I'm really struck, Greg, by you're making it very personal and showing people tie into that. Uh, now, much of the emphasis we've seen is talking about the pain that people have suffered and the horrible future they're facing. But we know to persuade people about making change, we sometimes have to portray what are some ways out? What are people doing to improve the situation and the courage and persistence people have demonstrated to reverse some of these things? Have any of the three of you done much in terms of picturing uh, some of the good news that some people are embodying now? Sorry, I, wanna, I was on mute there. I, I think some of the, the good news that I've been looking at um, has to do with science-based solutions. And I think there's a lot of people working on really big ideas. And I think there are gonna be some, some breakthroughs in the not too near future. I, I think it's, it's hard to kind of understand exactly where that's going to happen. But I think for, for me, in terms of my project that I'm going to continue working on, is I, I want to see where science is looking. Um, I, I follow scientists that are looking at um, different, planting different types of marsh that are more, uh, you know, protecting of sea level rise. I'm looking at, again, I'm working with a scientist right now who's looking at how to use farmland in different ways that has been inundated with salt water. So you can't grow crops anymore, but what can you do? Can you build habitat for, you know, uh, hunters? Can you build something that that you can that can be used in different ways? So I think there's a lot of of hard work being done just in my little area um, in in terms of trying to combat and find solutions. Um, the 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 reality is is that there's no there's no way to stop some of the, the events that are in motion here. Um, and I think that's something I want to impress upon people in the story is that there, there's no emergency breaks here. There's no reversing this. This is something that's going to happen, but we can decide how far it goes. And so that's kind of what I want to set up here is looking at, okay, like let's, let's establish this baseline and then let's go back and start looking at what can we do to stop this from further um, eroding the, the culture that, that exists on the Eastern shore. And I also wanna to add to that because Greg, you brought up so many amazing points in your talk um, that resonated with me as someone who lives also in a place that is eroding extremely rapidly. Um, and, you know, Fede also talking about um, talk responsibility and holding uh, institutions accountable. But I, I think that, um, you know, there are massive endeavors that are currently underway here in Louisiana that are some of the most ambitious 
land building projects in the world right now, um, literally changing the course of the Mississippi River. And I've been involved in documenting some of those projects that, you know, looking at open marsh isn't necessarily the most, isn't the uh, sexiest image to capture, but it's something that I think is important when you're trying to communicate what these landscapes that uh, have shifted over time, the importance of them and, and looking at the coastal zone and, and the importance of being able to maintain a healthy habitat like that. Um, so also in that rejuvenation of the land, thinking about communi communities that have lived there for generations and what it means um, for areas that are not necessarily getting that same investment because it's not something that is across the coast equal. It's very targeted in specific places that have to do with population concentration and also the connection to industry and all these other things. So um, there's a lot of layers to that. Kathleen Dreyer uh, raised her hand. So I, I wanna take her question next, but um, just before doing so, Kent, I wanted to speak quickly to your question um, as well as to Glenn's. Uh, Kent, on your question, I put two links into our chat or two projects I'm working on about sea level rise. And to kind of follow on from what Greg said, in the case of both of them, there, there's no way to solve this problem. Like, there isn't good news as such. That said, a lot of projects about sea level rise, mine included, are now looking at granting, we know that migration is going to happen how do you migrate meaningfully? So how do you hold on to culture and identity in the face of great change? And I think that's the win in a lot of ways. That's the positive story. Um, so both of the projects are looking, are looking at that. You can see the link, one's called The Coming Coast, one's called Eroding Edges, uh, just to give you an example from, from my work. Um, on Glenn's question about how we can make media that, that makes a difference, I think to really briefly bullet point things that I say in my classes, I say to students, first thing you need to do is think about your topic and how do you shift that to being a story? Like, how do, we, how do we build a story? How do we find characters? How do we find out what they're doing? Right, all this element of storytelling. And, and second, and this connects to the question about, um, about solutions, is that in our stories, we try to put in all, all four kinds of knowledge. And those four kinds of knowledge are, what is the problem and what are the impacts? Two, critically, why is this happening? Looking at some of the things that Fede was talking about, history, race, culture, psychologies, but getting critical about why. Um, three, how do we solve it? Focusing on solutions and four, focusing on visions. Well, where can we go? How can we build a better future? But I try to build all of those kinds of knowledge into my projects. And finally, I do it in collaboration. And this is the thing I feel like I'm always hammering on, but you can't make meaningful work without meaningful partnerships. And so from the outset, when I design a project, I think about financial partners, distribution partners, and impact partners. And there's, of course, there's too much to follow on now. But for me, designing my storytelling, my photography projects with those partners in mind from the outset is critical to, to being able to make a difference or to hope to make a difference. Okay, uh, I wanna pass over to Kathleen and her question. Thank you, Michael. Thank, um, thank you to all of the presenters for sharing your work and your heart. Um, I basically on the other side of the screen here, my mouth was kind of um, agape the entire time in shock just, uh, and taking in everything that you have shared with us. I'm, I'm curious always about how working on projects such as this affects us individually as photographers and um, impacts our own individual lives. So I'm wondering if any of you have anything that you are willing to share about how your own lives have been impacted by the work that you're doing, perhaps things that you're doing differently as a result of what you've learned in the course of doing these bodies of work that you're doing. Anything that you might be willing to share with us. Thank you. I'll say just a short word um, then, you know, I, I, I think sometimes, I mean, I, so I was blessed enough to be able to go to university, as I mentioned, I get to study at the undergraduate and, and the graduate level. And I think as a climate scientist by training, sometimes there's a temptation to, to bang our heads against the wall about why certain percent of the population don't understand this, don't agree with it, don't, don't get it, or there's a sort of willful sense of ignorance. Um, and a lot of 
misinformation as well. And I think for, for me in working closely with communities on the front lines of these issues, and a lot of these communities have a significant portion of people that, that fall into that category, that, that don't believe it's happening, don't, don't agree with the politics around it or, or whatever it is. I, I think for me, rather than becoming more frustrated with those communities, uh, it's really been a humanizing um, experience and not to let people off the hook for, well, for ignorance or for you know or any other a number of other things that are maybe not the prettier side of, of humanity. I've come to realize that understanding climate change is to a certain extent also a privilege. Um, you know, I think properly understanding it, um, it, it takes education, it takes time. A lot of people I work with work, you know, they, they're living day to day and climate change is not the number one thing that they're thinking about. A lot of times they're thinking about, you know, I, I, are, are my kids still gonna live on this island because the, the economy here doesn't work, you know? And so I think I've remembered to temper my my own rhetoric, I suppose, around this, and to really be more forgiving and try to build bigger circles. Um, and so it's it's pushed me to be more collaborative, I think, and um, more conciliatory um, to what I had identified as the other before. Um, I'll say really quickly too. It's you know I'm actually. I posted about this on social media a couple of days ago. And just to be completely candid, I've had a very hard time making new work since Hurricane Ida. Um, I was really involved in a lot of fundraising and relief work that was going on. And there's obviously still a number of parishes and communities in South Louisiana that are waiting on FEMA trailers, are you know not able to return to their homes for months, if not the rebuilding process is months, if not years long. So living through that experience and, and seeing the cycle of the media and how it is still something that is not necessarily, um, how quickly it still shifts and is not, and, and has some type of helicopter journalism still involved. This was the fifth strongest storm recorded on, in U.S. history, and thinking, you know, just about how the so many stories were talked about in sparing New Orleans, and that the levee system held, and how and how talking about these areas as buffer zones, and just thinking about, you know, what does that mean to call a place a buffer zone when you're talking about the priority being on an urban space or a more concentrated, densely um, populated area. Um, how it's ex uh, exploited and ex um, easily it is to to kind of forget about these coastal communities that are so important in terms of our national heritage and culture and and and, and a number of indigenous communities that that live along the coast for for generations. Um, so I'm feeling a, a bit a bit disheartened in the the past few months, but also talking about what Mike had mentioned around privilege and being able to to continue to, to work and, and document and tell these stories. Um, you know, fortunately I and my family uh, were, were spared physically ar around damage from the hurricane. Um, so being able to work with a number of people that were, were not so fortunate this time and, um, you know, just be in a place to, to move forward because you, you have to. In the few minutes we have left, I'd just like to ask a question that could be a can of worms and could lead to a very lengthy discussion, but we'll try to keep it to a five minute answer. There seems to be two schools of thought out there. One is that technology and science got us into this mess and we shouldn't look at technology and science to get, it, get us out of this mess. And then there's the other school of thought that says, well, we need to look at this and we need to look at particularly very advanced technologies such as uh, car, um, carbon sequestration and how to suck carbon out of the air. You know, these very capital intensive uh, technologies to um, not only mitigate the consequences of climate change, but also to um, heal what has happened. So what do the four panelists have to think about? What do, do you have any comments on the role of large scale technology to solve this problem? Michael, I see you smiling there. 
Um, you, you, you're right. This is an old, this reminds me of uh, many discussions in, um, during my master's uh, course at the University of Edinburgh. You know, I, it's something I've thought about a lot over the years. And I think the space that I'm in now is it's yes and. Yes, large tech fixes have a very significant role to play. Yes, also decolonizing the future and indigenous pathways have very significant roles to play. You can play a role as a scientist. You can play a role as a musician. So I, for me, the sort of the, the, the dialogue about is it this or is it that, um, it in some ways misses the point. I, get, I guess if we had to get really technical on it and dig down, we could say we could organize which are the most important solutions. But for me, there's just a lot, there's a lot of different ways to be involved and we need them all. And I think wherever you feel passionate, you can feel comfortable that as long as you're directing your energies in the right way, it can, it can make a difference. That, that said, we can't get lost in any one of those fixes as being you know, the golden bullet. I think sometimes that's more the issue, right? Is that we, we think we're gonna be able to sequester carbon and then we, you know, we, we, in the meanwhile, we, we take our eyes off the ball. And so we, we, we need to, and, and that's oftentimes what happens. So we need to be really careful not to do that. Not that we can just believe in these solutions and that keeps us from doing everything else. It's, it's yes and, and it's everyone on board. <laughs> Yeah, I'll second that. I, I think I think that's a really important point. Is that, you know, I, I think I think everyone does look for the solution, and I think there isn't one solution. I think it's a lot of little solutions because I, I, even even wonderful environmental solutions, wind farms, um, you know, di different solar uh, capture, all these things are good in moderate doses, but you know, we've, we've seen issues arise from each of them if they're used too much. And, you know, wave power, you start to absorb energy from the water and you, you actually have a chain reaction that has disastrous consequences for marine life. So again, it has to be something that, as, as Michael said, it's, it's, a, it's a whole world solution that needs to be implemented. And I think there's a lot of little things across the board that, that need to be looked at um to to kind of combat this and, and and turn things around so that you know we can we can continue to you know thrive on this planet yeah i will i will take then and maybe virginia can can close then uh but i i will say that yes of course we need everything that is at hand right now right but at the same time um there is a very old technology um, in, in human history, which is storytelling. And storytelling actually brings to big social changes too, and creates new ways and, we, and new meanings. And what um, critical scientists are saying uh, is actually, of course, we need to change the model of consumption of energy but we need to change the whole structure because if we if we bring new technologies on top of what we are already consuming it's all it's only going to make more problems for other people right uh, so i think that in terms of 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 a big and important technology and a very old technology too is storytelling to shift the culture to shift our ways of understanding also how we need to live in this earth and what we really need to live in this earth. So I think that, of course, this is, this is a more holistic response, but at the same time, I think that that's also the way we, we need to start thinking as storytellers and as visual storytellers. Yeah, and I don't know how much I have to add to, to what has already been said, but I, I do think also when I, when I think about technology, uh, a lot of it is synonymous with infrastructure to me and thinking about how it's not a neutral solution and, and how unpacking kind of the history of so much of the infrastructure, particularly in this country, is embedded in, in violence and inequality and how that plays out currently in terms of thinking about, as I look at with a lot of my projects in coastal communities, but also in areas that experience flooding, um, how that infrastructure that was considered neutral or still is considered to be 
um, neutral. It, it certainly is not and has a very political um, aspect to it. And, and there are humans making those decisions and what, what's guiding that policy. So um, yeah, I think just being cognizant of that and being able to really unpack that those histories in stories is always important, but you know, especially moving forward. All right, well, thank you for that. And that really brings us to the end of our time. So I'd really like to thank Michael for uh, moderating this discussion. And I really wanna thank Greg and Fede and Virginia for being here and presenting these amazing ideas and images. So if people could just unmute themselves and applaud our panelists. Thank you, Tom. Great, thank you very much. Very, very informative. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next time for the next Doc Matters, probably not until January sometime. But we do have an SDN salon coming up next week. All right. We'll look for the next Zeke magazine, Michael, on climate change. Terrific. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm very excited for it. And I put a link in the chat there to everyone um, for the upcoming uh, Zeke Award for Systemic Change. So if you have work in this field, mm -hmm. I, I do invite you to participate. And I also want to give a quick shout out here to SDN. Um, thank you so much for providing the space um, for these conversations to happen. I think it's really critical. And certainly I look at you guys as, as great partners um, in, in this work. This is a critical piece of it too. So thank you so much for, um, for making this available to everyone. Yeah, thank you for that, Michael. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Many thanks, all, all of right. you. And this will be posted right. on our YouTube page in a few days. Mm -hmm. Good night. Take care, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye.